evening, uh, everybody. Welcome you to this uh, very special event from the Bernstein Center. This is part of a series uh, of events uh, related to the financial crisis and what we can learn from it. And I will say that next uh, term, we're going to have a course in the MBA program, an elective on the future of financial services. Bruce Hogan and I and three of our colleagues will be teaching in that deliberately different perspectives. Uh, and I expect we're going to see some, and Eric Johnson is also teaching in that uh, class. I expect that we're going to hear some different perspectives tonight. Now, I've known Justin uh, for many years. He is a terrific thinker and writer <coughs> and blogger, I will say as well. Very insightful both on public policy and on economics. Uh, and he showed me his uh, slides here. I looked at it and I said, to the question, are finance professors to blame for the financial crisis? Uh, no, would be my <laughs> answer. But to the top one, that was a harder one for me to answer. And I won't explain the own complexities of my answer. It's more interesting for you to hear from Justin and hear, uh, hear your own thoughts. Uh, Justin is a Princeton graduate, very distinguished uh, fortune writer, reporter, and the author, of course, of the myth uh, of the uh, rational market. So, Justin. Thank you, Glenn. And I should say, first of all, that Glenn is a professor of finance and economics. So, he'd only be, you'd only be half to blame, right? right, if that, right. Okay, good. Um, and Glenn is actually right. What, what happened is Ray Fisman and I, who set this event up, I think I initially, when Ray asked for a topic, I, I initially emailed him the bottom one, our finance professors to blame for the financial crisis. And he came back with the top one. And the answers are different. <coughs> uh, another thing I should say is I'm a journalist. And journalists don't do PowerPoint. But I've started giving speeches over the last couple of months. And it seems to help. And so I threw this, I wasn't planning to do this one. I threw it together very quickly this afternoon. And I've, as I was riding up in the subway, I noticed misspelled words and the rest. So it'll be more fun that way. You can look for errors, <laughs> point them out. So the other thing that happened today was that um, the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal decided to get a head start on this talk. Where are you? Uh, there was a piece by Martin Wolf in the FT that was uh, a review of a new book by a economist and investment consultant named Andrew Smithers. And there was a piece by Jeremy Siegel in the Wall Street Journal. And Siegel's argument was basically that no finance professors, and in particular the efficient market hypothesis, are not at all to blame for this. And what was kind of funny is once I read both of them and, and saw their, their lead explanation for what was wrong, <coughs> Siegel's was, no, it's because it's really the Federal Reserve's fault for not cracking down on the housing bubble. And Wolf's argument was, yes, it is the efficient market theory's fault because it was the Federal Reserve's fault for not cracking down on the housing bubble. And they didn't crack down on the housing bubble because they were in thrall to this belief that financial market prices, so the prices for mortgage securities, must be right. So it's kind of interesting that you can come up with the same cause of the financial crisis and one person says it's the financial professor's fault, another says no. My own take. Well, first of all, I wrote this book. And there are piles of it out there. And it's more middle of the road than there's first typo than you might think. Um, and I say buy it. I used to always say read it. But my wife says, no, tell people to buy it. It doesn't matter if they read it. Um, it's a story about finance professors who get some things right, some things wrong, and along the way provide lots of really interesting lessons about how markets work. I mean, I don't think this whole project of academic finance over the last 40 years was some massive mistake or wrong turn. I just think it got some things more right than others. The last and most important is it was supposed to come out in May 2005. Um, so it wasn't about this financial crisis. And I, I'm actually very lucky that I'm incredibly slow and um, disorganized and all those other things. And it came out now. And now another really important fact that I've just learned, we have one of the, you know, not one of the lead characters, but a significant <coughs> character in the book here, Joel Stern. And I misidentified his place of origin. I said he's from Brooklyn, and he's from Fishkill. So first of all, if any of you have copies of the book, I'll, I'll get it fixed for the next printing. And if any of you have copies of the book and want me to correct it by hand, I'm happy to do that. I don't, I mean, I'm discovering you write a book this long, and even if you try to be careful, you discover things like this. And this is one of several. 
And I'm, I would imagine Joel will have some things to say later on when we go to the Q&A. So back to the topic. Our, well, and I'm phrasing it the way I originally did. Are finance professors to blame for the financial crisis? Well, here's some pretty good reasons why they're not. First of all, there were financial crises before there were finance professors. So <laughs> it's a little much to say it's all Gene Fama's fault that this happened. There were also a lot of other things going on over the past decade that led to these imbalances that seem to have unbalanced us all. I mean, obviously, politics and, and, and <coughs> policy decisions about housing at the Federal Reserve, new technologies on Wall Street, it's always technology leads to innovation, which leads to interesting times. And, and, and another is this whole issue of China and the US and these massive currency imbalances that are partly the result of China's decisions about how to grow quickly. And so, you know, I, I can't pin any of those on finance professors. Now, this is the third one. This is Gene Fama's at the University of Chicago. His standard line, nobody on Wall Street believes the efficient market hypothesis. Basically, people who go on Wall Street to try to make money don't believe a theory that says that anybody, any making of money on Wall Street is just luck. It, that's not quite what the theory says, but we'll get to that. And then finally, and this is really relevant here at Columbia, is there's lots of different kinds of finance professors. And I figure since we're at Columbia, we got to have Columbia's most famous adjunct finance professor. Um, this is Ben Graham writing in the first edition of Security Analysis in 1934, after you know, a very difficult time for both him and financial markets. And he says, the market's not a weighing machine. It's a voting machine. Which, wherein countless individuals register choices which are the product partly of reason and partly of emotion. Now, the interesting thing is, I mean, right around, the, and I wish I'd brought these, Graham's investment results, I mean, he was very successful in the 20s, and he totally nailed the crash. He was shorting all of these stocks that he thought was too, were too expensive, but he was always, he, he was a hedge fund guy. I mean, he was, I don't think he was the original guy, hedge fund guy, but he was a hedge fund guy before Alfred Winslow Jones was a hedge fund guy. And he would hedge these shorts um, on these overpriced stocks by at the same time buying preferreds in the same company with the, the idea that if the market kept going, going forward, he would at least be reducing his losses by owning the preferred shares of these companies. And what happened in the crash is you know, he, he, he covered all his shorts, made a ton of money, but these preferred stocks seemed so cheap in November 1929 that he just held on to them and just got pummeled. And he, he like lost, ended up losing 20% in 1929, even though probably through the end of October he was way up. Um, lost 50% in 1930, another, and then maybe 20% in 31, and 3 or 4% in 32 before he. So anyway, that, this is the person who was saying this. He'd been sort of chastened by his experience with markets. But then after a long and very successful career, <coughs> whoops, I went the wrong way. He gave this speech. It was the 25th anniversary, I think, of the New York Society, the founding of the New York Society of Security Analysts. And it was, it's just this fascinating document. I found it <coughs> in one of the bound copies of the Financial Analyst Journal in the library at Uris, at the business school, where I did a lot of the research for this book. And he basically, he tells these gathered financial analysts that neither, well, you guys can read it. Um, basically, you can't beat the market as a group. Professional investors can't because they've become the market. Maybe back in the 30s and 40s when professional investors were a pretty small part of the overall market pie, professional investors as a group could beat the market. But they'd reached the point by the, by the early 60s, and I think he talked about how many thousands and thousands of um, people with CFAs there were already by then. And, and so he said, instead, analysts are doing this important service to the community by fixing at most times and for most stocks a price level which fairly represents their comparative values. And basically, I think those two statements from Graham give a pretty reasonable sense of the continuum of how to intelligently think about how good a job the market does in, in setting values. It's a lot of the, you know, at most times and for most stocks, markets set a price level which fairly represents value. But it's a voting machine, not a weighing machine. And so there are, time, there are other times when that's just not true at all. So that's Ben Graham. But Ben Graham <coughs> wasn't really part of, although interestingly, he actually, he was, by, by the early 60s, he was out in Southern California. 
and he hung out a lot at UCLA. He was very aware of, well, I'll get to, I'll get to what he was aware of. He's aware of Harry Markowitz, and I'll tell you about Harry Markowitz in a second here. But what I'm talking, so when I'm talking about finance and finance professors, it's this approach to the study of finance that was something new and different, and it emerged mostly at the University of Chicago and MIT in the 1950s and 1960s. And pre-1950s, finance as taught in business schools was this pretty anecdotal, case, you know, case by case approach. And there's this great quote from Merton Miller, um, who he was at uh, Carnegie Mellon, I guess it was still called Carnegie Tech then in Pittsburgh, and he was teaching economics. He got an offer to teach finance in the new business school there, and the pay was better. And so um, he went and sat in on a finance class. And the, as he told it years later, the professor told this one story about this one company and drew these lessons out of it. And Merton and Miller's like, oh, okay, those, those are the, the theories. That's how it goes. Then the professor moved on to a different example and drew completely different lessons from it. And so Miller's, Miller's frustration with it was, everything was, as they say on railway tickets, good for this train and this day only. There was no systematic approach. That was his frustration. So a, a year or two before, Merton Miller made this, you know, sat in on this finance class, a student at the University of Chicago, Harry Markowitz, came up with a systematic approach to investing that was all about balancing <coughs> risk and return in a quantitative fashion. It was just advice for investors. It wasn't a theory of how the market works or anything. And, and basically, he, he was able to do this by equating risk with variance, um, by you know, how much you think a particular security is going to bounce around. And interestingly, Markowitz always figured, at the beginning, he just thought this was a way for existing Wall Streeters, security analysts, to just think more clearly about what they were doing. That the variances and that all the, all the numbers to be thrown into his formulas would be things that people exercising judgment would come up with. The problem was nobody on Wall Street at that time wanted to do that. It seemed like a pain, and it also meant constantly testing your past estimates to see if they were any good. And People generally don't like to do that unless they're forced to. And, and so what ended up happening years later, and I, I wouldn't blame Markowitz for this, is a lot of people based, you know, based their portfolio theory on just looking at historical variants of various stocks and figuring, OK, if we just know the past, we can predict the future. Um, now, a few years later, in the late 50s, came the Miller Modigliani papers, and, and I think the crucial point, and, and Joel, who's read them far more than I have and actually had this stuff taught to him by Merton Miller, may have a different sense of it. But my thing, the basic point of these famous papers, one from 1958, one from 1961, is that it's a useful thing if you're trying to solve some finance puzzles that have been stymieing finance professors for years. And the, and, and the sort of crucial ones are, you know, what, what's the cost of capital? What's the proper capital structure? Um, what, what should your dividend policy be? It's a useful, simplifying assumption to just figure that the prices in the, of, of, of your stock as a company are being rationally set, and that those prices include all the information you really need to know to make a decision about these things. So that was the M&M papers. And then um, a couple years after that came the capital asset pricing model, which was arrived at independently by Jack Trainer and Bill Sharp. And it, basically there, it's, you're trying to come up with a theory of how assets are priced. And a, a nice, simple way to do that is you assume basically everybody acts like Harry Markowitz says they should act. And that um, return follows risk, and that you can measure risk. That, that there is this thing, beta is what they came up with, that is a pretty useful gauge of the return classes of different stocks going forward. And then finally, in the, I mean, the, the phrase was first used by Eugene Fahm in a paper in 1965, <coughs> but his actual sort of laying out of what, what, it, what it meant um, was in, at, at the American Finance Association meeting in 1969 was the efficient market hypothesis. Now, what is this efficient market hypothesis? The initial the motivating idea was it's hard to predict the market. But, I think it's fair to say at the University of Chicago in the late 60s and in a lot of places by the 70s, the general assumption was we can't predict the market because market prices are fluctuating around the fundamental value of the underlying asset. So the only thing that's going to change 
the market prices is going to be news, which by definition you don't know. So, you know, unless you have really good information that other people don't have, you can't say anything useful about where a particular stock or the market is going. Now, at the same time, and this isn't formally part of, part of the efficient market hypothesis, but this was coming along at the same time that lots of people in finance were warming to this idea that we can predict risk because risk is more or less constant over time, and I, I call this the convenient market hypothesis. Um, and, and it's, you know, Fisher Black was one of the few who really said this sort of, it, it's just like, okay, I'm not saying I can perfectly predict variance, but I, it's a hundred times easier than trying to predict where exactly <coughs> a stock is going. I can say a lot more about the likely bounds within which it will fluctuate than where it's going. And he's probably, he's right about that. But I, I, I think that just ended up being this sort of basic part of a lot of what was taught in MBA programs in a lot of places. And, and then <coughs> the capital asset pricing model where this risk that you can measure to a certain extent predicts return and actually Fama <coughs> in the very end of his famous efficient markets paper said, you know, if we're trying to say with efficient markets more just than, okay, it's, it's hard to predict what the market's doing. If we're trying to say that maybe markets are in, in any sort of fundamental way doing things right, we need a theory of how prices are set to test that by. And the theory that seems to make sense to use is the capital asset pricing model. And the early tests seem to back that up. I mean, in the early 70s, there were, Obama did one, a few other people did one, and they, they seem to back up that idea that prices in the stock market moved based on the beta, the variability with relation to the overall market of, of, of stocks. And so, and, and this is where, because I think everybody sees the theory in different ways. I think Joel Stern has very different ideas of what the efficient market is. I don't think he ever believed that markets were ever perfectly rational or perfectly right all the time. But I, my sense from reading through the debates from those days in the, in the 70s and, and, and 60s through the 80s is that that was what was at stake. There were a bunch of people who were arguing that we think, I mean, we know they're just, prices are fluctuating around fundamental values, but we think the fluctuation is in within pretty small bounds. And so for a lot of different purposes, it's just, it's just let's just assume prices are right. Now, interestingly, uh, anomalies and, and sort of logical flaws in this thinking started cropping up really in the early 70s. And they weren't just brought up by critics of the efficient market like Larry Summers or Bob Schiller, but also by very orthodox finance professors. Um, Richard Roll at UCLA who was responsible for several of them. And Fama himself by the 80s was also sort of saying that, OK, this sort of perfect model of the efficient market plus the capital asset pricing model don't fit together. But, my sense, again, I wasn't there, but reading the textbooks, talking to people, is that those anomalies and logical flaws didn't play a big role in MBA level education at the places that really believed in the efficient market. I would imagine at Columbia it was somewhat different. And I also think these ideas, because they're powerful ideas and they're at least partly right, affected lots of people who weren't true believers on Wall Street and, and elsewhere. And I think, I think the thinking of and this is where I think Fama is a little bit wrong. I think a lot of people on Wall Street, yes, they believe they're very smart and they can find some inefficiency and take advantage of it, but they're doing it within this wider framework of markets that work as this great weighing machine eventually. And that's the classic Warren Buffett. I mean, Warren Buffett, I, and I'm pretty sure Graham never said this. I think it's just Buffett, although I may be wrong. Buffett takes that Graham line about weighing machine and voting machine and says, you know, over the over the short run, it's a voting machine. Over the long run, it's a weighing machine. And I guess a lot of this whole discussion is about, well, what's the long run? I mean, are we talking over 60 years or over five? Because that's a big difference. Now, because there was all this research, and I, I think the, the, the classic paper in this was Fama. And, and I just, to me, this is so admirable that this guy who proposed, okay, here's this theory and here's how we would test it. And he goes and does other things for 15 or 20 years and then he comes back and he tests it again. And it doesn't fit, it, it doesn't work. Basically, the combination of the efficient market hypothesis and the capital asset pricing model, it doesn't work. Now, Fama, understandably, because the efficient market hypothesis was his theory, chooses to jettison the capital asset pricing model and says, no, what, there, there seem to be these different risk factors. And, and one of them's um, size, one of them's value, um, 
Okay? And one of them is beta. That's still a factor in there. And later on, some of his students and others at Chicago added on momentum as this other factor. Um, and I, I guess my problem with those is there's no real <coughs> economic theory behind them. It's just you look through the data and those seem to be the, the things that allow a little bit of outperformance and they seem to explain some of the prices. So over the past few months, I mean, there have been people like Paul Krugman wrote this big article in the New York Times Magazine bashing economics in general, but especially Chicago and the efficient market hypothesis. And, and John Cochran wrote this big response and one big part of it was, oh, but all we ever, all the efficient market hypothesis means is that the market, markets are ha hard to out, are outsmart, really hard to predict. It doesn't mean anything else. And I guess m my sense is if that were all that finance professors from Chicago and MIT and elsewhere had to offer, um, they wouldn't have gotten, you know, finance professors wouldn't be the most highly paid professors by most measures um, at universities and they wouldn't have gotten all these great consulting jobs and lots of other things. So, I, I mean, I think that's, that's the first part. It, this whole construct of academic finance that grew up starting in the 60s, there was more to it than just, gee, we, we can't predict the market. Um, the other thing is, I mean, and this, I, I'm sort of on the fence here, but I think there are a lot of people, at the, even at the Federal Reserve now, Bill Dudley, the new president of the New York Fed, argues this, that to a certain extent, we can identify asset bubbles while, while, while they're happening. We can't do it with any kind of precision. We can't say when they're gonna end. And, and if you're an investor in the market, it's incredibly hard to make money off that. But maybe at some level, this knowledge that these bubbles happen and they share certain traits, like you know, really rapid growth and credit, that might be something for the Fed to think about in making policy in the future. I, 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 my initial sense, and I think this is sort of informed by spending so much time talking to Chicagoans and reading, reading their papers, is that it would be better if this policy were just some automatic rule rather than relying on the infinite wisdom of our Fed chairman. And this is already, I'm just suddenly flashing back to the great Glenn Hubbard Fed video, which I should have included in my, uh, if any of you have never watched that, I'll put it up on my blog tomorrow. And, you know, check it out. I just, okay, so here's, now I'm getting towards the answer here and then we'll go to having a conversation. I, I think it would be a really great idea for finance professors at Chicago and elsewhere to stop saying all we ever meant was that markets are hard to outsmart to saying, gee, I wonder why so many people think an efficient market is a market that gets prices right and whose risks are easy to estimate. And I wonder if we played a role in making them think that. And I, I just think at some level, maybe they didn't, maybe it's totally, but it, it, one of the things that's actually would be fascinating <coughs> to trace here is it seems like it's people in the UK who have this belief more strongly than anybody else. If you read the opinion page of the FT, they, they're just constantly bashing the efficient market. And when they're bashing it, they mean the efficient market plus the capital asset pricing model altogether. I mean, that's what they seem to be bashing. There's this book that's really wonderful in lots of ways by George Cooper, a money manager in London called The Origins of Financial Crises. But there's, that, there's never any attempt in the book to separate the idea of the efficient market and this idea of a market that sort of obeys the normal distribution, statistical distribution in, in all its movements. But I guess my, my answer, I, I don't think it's adequate for people in finance, academic finance to say, oh, you guys are wrong. There should be a little more discussion of, gee, well, maybe we should you know, take a look at what the CFA Institute is teaching people or what's being taught in MBA textbooks or whatever else. Which leads me, and I think, I'm not sure this is, well, this is one other aspect, and I just sort of been thinking about it the last couple of days, partly because of the column I'm writing this week for time, is I think to some extent a bunch of people in academic finance sort of morphed into apologists for Wall Street, and it's, which is really interesting because for a lot of the people who were really involved in the whole random walk efficient market thing in the, in the 60s, it was a critique of Wall Street. They were bashing the stupid mutual fund managers who claimed that they could beat the market by 20 or 30 percentage points every year. Um, and then in the, in the 70s, it was sort of, a, it, it morphed somewhat into this critique of how corporate America <coughs> thought about things. And I talk about this in the book. Uh, Joel Stern, his part of it was, you know, treat investors like they're a bit more intelligent than you do. Because right now, 
what every, I mean, in the 60s, every CFO, but the problem is, this is sort of most of them still do this. They're all just thought, oh, if I just make my earnings look good, then the markets will love me. And Joel's point was actually they care more about the underlying stuff. It doesn't matter about the earnings. Michael Jensen, another Chicago product, I mean, his lesson was, well, gee, we need to find a way. If we want these, these companies to get around the agency problems that keep CEOs from focusing on what really creates value over time, we need to find a way to sort of impose more market, financial market discipline on these guys. And so I think for very good reason, I think these were both totally valid points, but what it sort of evolved into is that finance scholars, not all finance scholars, but certainly since the early 80s have been a defender of pretty much every Wall Street innovation from the rise of leveraged buyouts, which we now call private equity, to derivatives, to everything else. And I think there's been a lot of value in those things, but I think it would be really great, and I think this is starting to happen a little bit, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. It'd be really great if a lot of people in academic finance started sort of looking at, because clearly we reached some point where our financial system wasn't really serving the public good. Even, even if you buy all these other explanations that went wrong, I think there was something, our financial system was too big. I think there's pretty widespread agreement about that. So I, I think it would be great if a lot of the focus in academic finance over the next few years became kind of trying to test. Well, how do we tell if Wall Street's too big? How do we tell whether derivatives <coughs> really serve all these purposes that they theoretically should, but we don't quite know if they do? And, that's what my column is actually about, a professor at some <coughs> other business school in Manhattan who's been doing that just really over the past couple of years, Thomas um, Philippon at NYU. But I just think that's the kind of questions I want answered because I don't want to get rid of our financial system. I don't want to shut down Wall Street. I, I don't want to go to the level of regulation that we had in the 1930s, but it'd be really nice to sort of know because I don't think we want what we just had for the past few years. It'd be nice to know, you know what is an appropriate size for Wall Street. I don't think we'll ever have the right answer, but it seems like a good question to be asking. So, leads me finally, and, and Glenn sort of took away my punchline, but are finance professors to blame for the financial crisis? No. But should finance professors take the blame for the financial <coughs> crisis? Yeah, some of it at least. I, I think it'd be helpful, because I think it would, it would move the discussion forward in all sorts of interesting ways that will reveal things that maybe will, I mean, we're never gonna not have financial crises, but, Maybe we can put it off for a little couple years longer than we would otherwise. And that's my talk. I would love to have a chat.